Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for these two, two really powerful talks. And the least we can say, I think, is that they intersect and resonate in many ways, in particular in the critical emphasis on and, and the questioning um, of, of loneliness in death. That was quite uh, striking. Um, I wonder actually who paired these talks. That was a good intuition. <laughs> um, questions, I will take um, any question. Christopher, yes. <coughs> Thanks to both of you for the presentations. I'll maybe start with a question for Alex and try to fold it into Michael's as well. I was actually thinking about, as you were talking about the sort of even opaquely experiencing the death of others and thinking about like the hold, right? And the experience of the hold and that experiencing of, right? The living and dying of others and how the hold in some ways kind of breaks these assumptions about non-relationality that you're talking about. And I was just wondering if you could maybe speak a bit more because I'd really be interested in your thinking about, yes, blackness in a general sense, but what are some of those sort of specific sites of black life and de death that particularly, right, disrupt this kind of non-relationality assumption that you're pointing to, because uh, I just found it really interesting and generative in that context. I mean, the hold was what came to mind for me, but I'm sure there's, you know, a litany of others we could think about. And Michael, to your um, presentation, really, I guess I was, a lot of things I was thinking about, but one was, well, I'll speak to two. One was about relationality or relationlessness in the context of burial because you sort of spoke a lot to right the sort of isolation of the body like in maybe a house or when someone's found but in some ways when the body is buried one then becomes right in relation to other people sort of in relation to where you are and where someone else is so is is there a way that we can think about similar to the life and death context is it is relationless kind of, is it a protracted thing? Does it sort of start and stop? Is it sort of ebbing and flowing? And the last part um, is also about, uh, I guess, discursive relation, right? So one may, like I was thinking about people's cell phones in the context of this, right? Like if someone may be texting, like we don't know, right? Yeah, there may not have been somebody to quote, find them per se, but maybe they were texting with someone. Maybe they're like DMing somebody. Like maybe there's still a type of relation that isn't, I guess, manifest in the tactile and particularly I like, think about pandemic context, other things. I don't know, I was just thinking about what are the ways we can think about, I guess, the multiple valences or ebbs and flows of that, but thank you both. Thank you for that. Um, is this on? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I'll just go with that then. Um, I mean, the very, very short answer to that is it's everywhere. That's that's my point. But I think, you know, the hold of the slave ship is a really great example because it pulls together all the different forms of death that I was talking about, right? I mean, I only mentioned it briefly, but for me, it's not only about the physical death of, you know, um, your people, your ancestors, et cetera, and so on, but it's also about the enforced death of language, of forms of gender, of culture, et cetera, and so on. And But my point is that that is not only something that happens during the Middle Passage, right? I think death is kind of the precondition for existing um, in this world for black people, right? So, and all of these different kind of deaths, they don't necessarily all need to occur at the same time or even occur, but they're ever present, right? Um, so that's really where I would um, um, I, I, I would take your, um, 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 your your question, because I think it does work on the kind of micro basis, right? That statistically, as Black people, we can have the expectation that we will encounter the death of someone in our family. Right. That's like a statistical probability. But I think it's really also important to not only think about death in those terms, but also in all of these other other kinds of um, um, terms. And I and the other thing that I would say is that death for me is not something that is inert. Right. And this is really what I'm trying to sort of work through um, 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 in with thinking about the lives of the dead as opposed to the dead. Right. 
or just death. And I think that that's a really important distinction that, um, that considers the kind of um, pressure that death, dying, et cetera, and so on exerts on what we would call life or the living, right? And that's really kind of where sort of the hold that I want to stay in, right? That's, that's um, um, yeah. So thank you. Yeah, actually, um, even just to riff on that a little bit, um, the hold or some of these spaces, they gather, right? They collect, um, but then they can also spread uh, in various ways, you know? And burial tends to contain death, um, but because of different displacements in Japan um, and the depopulation of the countryside and uh, break up in certain ways of families and whatnot uh, and the desirability of that, a lot of people, and even space in urban centers in Tokyo, right, um, people are unable to bury uh, their dead um, or to visit their buried dead, right? So then you have all of these stones going up, um, which are monuments to the disconnected, right? Um, so it's like a grave of the forgotten, but not a soldier. <laughs> um, but that's being used by the nation, by the nation state, by the state uh, in various ways and appropriated to almost turn it into a national memorial that gathers people around this figure of death, which has spread so far beyond any body uh, and I mean anybody or any body, <laughs> right? Um, such that signs of death circulate so broadly um, that it transforms, as it were, the possibilities and meanings and significance of life uh, to the extent that that's a, a concept that matters, right? Um, yeah, the discursive relations, obviously, right, um, alone together, Bowling alone, you got all this stuff on social capital, you got all that, right? Um, those kinds of relations uh, are still searching for relationality. They're trying to make a claim that, you know, oh yes, people are still related and all of this. And that seems to be in response to these kinds of discourses of a collapse of various sorts of relationality. That's important. Uh, and you know, I think it's, it's a significant political project to reveal these existing relations that are still out there that get covered up by certain dominant discourses, uh, normative discourses. At the same time, I'm trying to move slightly away from looking for and identifying, here's where the relation is now, here's where the relation is now, to allow different potentials to, to open up and to play with negativity in various ways. Thank you. Hadi, you had a question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's my dormancy. Uh, so, <laughs> Michael, dormancy. Uh, is, isn't relationlessness uh, a kind of dormancy on the way to be no dormancy onto death? Uh -huh. Is it uh, on the same, in, within the same? Uh, same scale, uh, uh, same spec within the same spectrum. Uh, also, um, your, your, your talk is very much related, not only uh, to Alex, but also to uh, Rebecca's uh, talk yeah. from yesterday about care. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and uh, uh, immeasurability of the labor of care uh, and the problem it poses for any capitalist organization of labor. Uh, and it's always capitalism that is the, um, uh, that, that is problematized through uh, this, these examples. And, and in your case, it was not just the capitalism, capitalist system, it's, it's something about Japanese organization of society, the notion of the nation, I, I, I'm not familiar, uh, but there is something specific about uh, which goes beyond capitalism and cannot be reduced to capitalism. So I'm, this is just a question, an invitation to speak about this. Yeah. Uh, and Alex, I, I, I'm really, I was really intrigued by your uh, it, uh, 
use of Heidegger in order not to use him. Uh, and and I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your interest in Heidegger. Um, I assume, but I, maybe it's not the case, but I assume that it, you know, it's not just a critical reading of Heidegger. There's something in Heidegger that you think with. Uh, so, uh, if, if you can if you can say something about this, uh, if you can say something about the difference between Schwarzsein and Judenzein, uh, would it, in Heidegger and in Heideggerian thinking, without you know the specific passages where you find the traces, and also the. You, you, you spoke about the animal and the, or the lizard and the stone, uh, wordlessness and poor and moral, opposite of the order. Uh, so this is an ontological uh, differentiation and very problematic, of course. Uh, but the, the Judenzein and Schwarzsein uh, would be historical differentiation, uh, or we could think about them historically. And I, I don't think that, that Heidegger, at least uh, about a Juden, it, it, think about uh, Jews uh, rationally, uh, biologically. I think there are clear passages where we exclude this, this possibility. So, so can you map this? In? Um. I don't think it's only historical. I think Heidegger wants the distinction to be historical, um, but I don't think in my reading of Heidegger um, of both the Jew and the black, quote unquote, is not even the black, it's a, the Senegalese. That's his specific example in one of the, um, um, one of, one of the later um, 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 texts. And, um, and I think because he positions both the Jew and the um, black as outside of that system, and in some ways as outside of, um, as not having access to Dasein in the same way, I'm reading it as something that is ontological, even though Heidegger does not want me to, but I'm, I'm also just like, fuck you um, to Heidegger. Um, and, and I think what my interest of, um, um, in, in, in Heidegger is, is because of the, this idea about death, right? I think is really, um, 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 re really um, 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 important and using as a, um, as, as death as a way to define being, right? So that's really what interested me there. And in general, what interests me in, um, 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 in um, 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 Heidegger is actually, as opposed to a lot of other German philosophy, which I actually deeply hate, like in a very visceral way, um, is what he does with the German language, right? Um, less so in the kind of dogmatically philosophical text, like being in time, but like in his lectures, there's a kind of elegance in the language, right? And I also think, you know, people are like, well, he was a Nazi, and I'm just like, that's kind of also my point in using him, right? Because I think um, saying that Heidegger was a Nazi and that, you know, Hegel and Kant and all the other sort of great German philosophers were better because they were simply not a, par a, um, a member of the, um, of, of the NSDAP, of the, of, of, of the Nazi party, once again exceptionalizes like everything about that. And um, yeah, but like I said, I'm also just not really that interested in Heidegger itself. There's been some really interesting work being um, actually done on Heidegger, particularly by German Jewish intellectual Jakob Taubes, who talks about um, 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 Heidegger as in some ways also being on the outskirts of Germanness because he was Catholic and, um, um, and, and from the south of Germany. He wasn't Prussian in the same way that Kant and Hegel and a lot of the, um, 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 and, and, and a lot of the um, others um, um, were, so that he's always writing as this kind of outsider wanting to get access to Germanness. But um, yeah, I'm not really particularly interested in that. I, what I really want to take from here is this idea that death defines being and how that defines being and how that works really, really differently if we're looking at it from the perspective of blackness and um, 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 and um, 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 Schwarzsein, right? And um, 
Yeah, and to go back to the beginning to reiterate that again, I think that's giving Heidegger a little bit too much credit to say that, you know, the way that he writes about the Jew and the black are in some ways, he wants it to be historical, but it doesn't really work within that um, um, with, with, within that system in in the way that I'm um, that, that that I'm um, um, reading him because there's really no place for that, right? There's really no place for um, 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 for for either of those um, um, identities, categories, forms of being in his theory of being. So I liken it more um, the way that I read it is that um, um, the black and the Jew are at the most on the level of animals and much, much more likely on the level of stones because they do not have that same, according to Heidegger, that, that, that same sort of access to the sphere of um, 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 Dasein. But that's my particular reading, right? In terms of where I'm coming from as an intellectual, as a person, you know, et cetera, and so on, that that's kind of my, my reading. I, and I think I can't really work with Heidegger if I don't read him that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for this question. I love it, and I love putting it into relation uh, uh, <laughs> with dormancy, uh, which I was wondering why that's a metaphor, but that's a, a separate conversation. Um, it certainly could be, and this could be a way in which there might be something ostensibly Japanese about it, separate from capitalism. Uh, though I hesitate to say that because, of course, contemporary Japan is, is a relatively recent unit in certain ways that wasn't always Japan, etc. I ask it because you mentioned the resistance. <laughs> I ask it because you mentioned the resistance to immigration to yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. To, to this. Oh yes, certainly. So, so in relation to not a Japanese essence, but Japanese uh, Japanese nationalism. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Absolutely right. There's a closing of the borders. There's valuations and, and devaluations of Latin necro politics all over the place. Right. I mean, uh, colonialism uh, and violence that that continues um, in in all, all of this discourse. Right. And so, in some ways, even the need to bring in more trainees from China uh, or the Philippines to care, that itself is perceived as a sign of relationlessness. Oh my goodness, we need to bring in outsiders in order to provide the care that we can't and don't provide for each other as Japanese, blah, 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 right? Um, and so that, that, without a doubt, is, is a part of this. Um, but also in relation to dormancy, it's interesting, I didn't have the space uh, and I just didn't feel like it, um, to, to go into uh, mueng, this relationless, without the ness or without the ghost or the spirit <laughs> or the society. Mueng also has roots in the 1400s uh, as a political category of people who were not attached to feudal domains and so they could move between them. And so it carries with it a certain idea of freedom um, that then turns into Janis Joplin, right? <laughs> right? Freedom, nothing, just right, in other words, nothing left to lose. So you're completely lost after death. Um, but this transition is being reappropriated. So in a sense, that sense of relationlessness was sleeping for feminists to now uh, awaken as it were, um, to move away from the gendered system of, of domination uh, and oppression that's so common there. In relation to care, I would argue critically, uh, of course there's a capacity, there's an excess, there's all these things to care that, that exceed the, the measure, et cetera, right? But I would, I would critique it, uh, and actually in the, in the manuscript, um, I argue that compassion spreads relationlessness and a sense of, of hopelessness and inability to change the world, right? Um, so it's this attempt to engage with suffering in order to ameliorate it, right? And then what are you going to do? You can't. And so instead of ameliorating it, you absorb it and you spread it. And this quality of relationlessness spreads in that way. It's in the purposeful engagement with it to try to do away with it. Right? Um, and then it's like, who has the burden of caring? Who doesn't have the burden of caring? Why? Right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's also highly gendered. And my friends, many of whom are monks, have physically collapsed and destroyed their, their personal Buddhist traditions uh, 
in the name of compassion, which then leaves them alone um, and without this history to lean back on. Right? Because compassion has become universalized by certain laws and rulings of the state that control public space. Yeah, and I, I could talk about that for far too long, but uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Amanda? Yeah, so I'm not sure that this question is relevant, but it's, it's for you, Michael. I thought your paper was uh, quite mesmerizing and um, sort of uh, conceptually, and it was uh, extremely nuanced. You're very careful. It's profoundly non-reductive. Um, but I'm kind of wondering like where you're left with your sort of rigorous refusal of having any kind of, I'll just use a strong word, ideal, you know, to juxtapose um, against the negative. Yeah. So there were just a couple of moments. For, now, uh, first I just want a clarification on something you said. At one point you said kinship, you referred to kinship as something that certain people, and I can't remember who they were, no longer find interesting. Okay, could you just clear, like, did you mean traditional kinship? Yeah. Or did you mean kinship? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting question, right? It, it's also this discourse in anthropology, right, which uh, people are interested in kinship as the basis for all sorts of political systems and all this stuff. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of work of on alternative kinship. Right, right, right. Okay. That's right. So, so, but I feel like you're saying kinship to court, that you're cathected onto that sentence. Yeah. Like that was a <laughs> sentence that you were cathected onto along with the last one about capacitating the negative. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so my kind of, um, you know, one thing I would surmise is that yeah. the cathexis for you is on the con on the conceptual acrobatics rather th i mean this is kind of harsh i don't mean to be harsh but nope. um, but we you know if we become relationless you know nothing <laughs> will have changed no um, but no but seriously i kind of feel like yeah what what has to be and is in so much of your analysis a sociological yeah. an ethical and in some ways a psychological issue that has to be approached critically in all of those registers becomes transformed into an intellect, it's intellectualized um, or philosophicalized <laughs> through this notion of the interesting, mm -hmm. which, you know, right? And this notion of uh, capacitating the negative. So you could just opine about that maybe <laughs> or reject it or. No, thank you so much. And, and first uh, with the kinship, um, obviously, if we want to make that a very broad concept to mean any sort of obligation that you enter into with people, that's still interesting. And by interesting here, I mean that it draws enough attention to make itself felt and real for some people, right? Um, I don't just mean... Interesting. Interesting. Oh, interesting, right? The way literary critics... Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's not fascinating, right? It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't draw you yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, in a certain way. Um, and so I think there's been a move here too to figure out what might um, collectivities look like if we don't think of them as society, which is structured in a certain way that tends to be predicated upon kinship, which then in one way or another becomes about reproduction, right? Um, without an ideal, ouch. Uh, no, I, I think it's built into the critique. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is not at all a purely intellectual exercise. This is for um, the generation of a concept in a certain audience, in a, you know, in a certain venue um, with certain wonderful people. But I'm out there, we're trying to build community and keep people alive um, if they wanna be alive. Uh, doing suicide hotlines, right, um, and, and all of this kind of stuff, uh, and caring for aging and, and dead people <laughs> all over the place. Um, and so uh, I don't have any clue, right, what the solution is, but I don't want to pose any of this as a problem. 
Um, because then you, I mean, based on the evidence that I, I see in the world, and I'm very limited, I have no, again, no clue. Um, but posing it as a problem just, you know, um, is, a, is a deeply conservative, anti-political move that doesn't allow for possibilities that I can't foresee because I'm still enmeshed in this and just trying to take care of people as it were, right? Um, and I'm exhausted uh, and I'm trying to work through that. Um, and so there's a defense in here of critique um, without presenting a positive model, mm -hmm. right? Um, to allow for a breakdown, to allow for negation, to allow for historically specific absences and negation, rather than negation or the negative, um, to open up potentials that we ourselves can't necessarily um, create, imagine, or control. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mine is just a small uh, question for Michael that may be, um, may be sort of reaching out for, for a similar, in a similar way to, to Amanda's. Um, uh, I was just, I was struck by the scene that you describe of the meeting where, um, uh, where the, where the, where, where neither the, the, the corpse nor indeed the life of the dead person is actually at the center of the discussion, uh, but there are all these other sort of um, institutional, logistical, societal levels at which the, uh, to which the discourse is, is moved. And, um, and of course, if you were delivering this paper in, in Japanese, I probably would not have had this idea, but since you were delivering it in English, I couldn't help hearing in relationlessness, mm. also the uh, possible suggestion that a certain story is not related. So, so in a sense, the 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 non-relation of a certain narratives or story or you know account. Um, so, the unnarratedness of something or the un um, narratingness, uh, the un yeah the, the unavailability of something. In that in that moment, so I mean, Vazira after the last panel was asking was raising the question of dormancy as a possible time phase or or pause that there can be no full accounting of, uh -huh. um, and so this is what made makes me want to ask this question. So is this is this part of what you're thinking with, and in that case, is relationlessness also thinking with the um, uh, a way of accounting for times uh, or situations where the the where um, one can only uh, continue to put in circulation this non-narration, um, but also maybe a material reflection on a situation where the structures for telling a story might have uh, might be fraying or, or might have broken down or, or something like that. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll pull a you. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, I think um, it's interesting. Many people writing in response to this uh, have written about hope, right? And I, I wrote a, a piece where I just critique hope. Um, because hope is, it tends to be future oriented, right? And so many of us here and today and, and yes, there's no hope. The concept's not going to save us, this, that, the other, right? Um, and as it turns out, these sites of misery where people are working really hard to come together, become the ethical substance, the, the material that others use to create hope. So they say, oh, look, these people, they survive. Oh, look, these people, they, they made it and they come together and they're so resilient and blah, blah, blah. That's, we thought we had lost that, but it's still here. Look at them. That is our past and now it's also our future because it continues. The durability and the amazingness of humans, and blah, 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 blah. And in the process of producing that, I, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to bring it back to a concrete uh, example. 
you know, we worked for years to create community in these temporary housing units where people have lost a lot. Um, and over years, people come to, right, like you start to make friends and, and have some good times. In the name of the future, they built a Hope Highway to connect the region to Tokyo to encourage business. And the Hope Highway literally paved over the temporary, the temporary, right, housing units. Literally, I watched, we watched them bulldoze. We protested as a bulldoze, right? Right? And so... For me, um, I'm sorry, I went uh, and I'm upset, <laughs> right? Um, but for me, opening up a gap and not moving toward a future and perhaps allowing dormancy of the temporary to endure facilitates different internal differences that we could call as hope because they have an endurance, right? And so this is a non-temporal notion of hope. It's a spatial notion, if we want to, you know. Um, and, and so that's where I would potentially go with that. Um, but to do that, and then I'll be quiet. I'm so sorry, but this is great, right? But to do that, I do, I think we need to um, allow also for the irrelevance of certain discourses at certain times and produce certain relationlessnesses between things. So I believe we have two questions, one here and then Tim. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for your paper. Um, I always appreciate how you insistently read Hartman as a philosopher of time in a particular kind of way. This comes up obviously in your latest book um, where she's a thinker of the now. And so I'm wondering if you could talk more about how um, Heidegger's understanding of death, of course, is the ground by which he understands historicity and temporality mm -hmm. and how your use of Hartman and of course in Venice and Two Acts, how this insistence on drawing the life out of death mm -hmm. um, is also a kind of critique of how finitude mm -hmm. relates to being mm -hmm. and how blackness seems to uh, exceed that, right? Like seems to always jump over the, 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 the finite into the infinite um, in a very Fanonian kind of way. And so I wonder if you could talk about what that has to do with what you think about the now, immediacy in general, and how Hartman is helping you think about temporality differently. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but I think what I would say um, provisionally is that for Heidegger, this idea of finitude is it's a kind of it's a future horizon right and even if it's like the structuring thing right um it's still something that occurs somewhere in the future from um i'm from now whereas what hartman is writing about with our intimacy with the lives of the dead is kind of in this permanent presence right um that the lives of the dead are not it's not something that will happen to us right um, that we can then authentically um, recognize. It is something that we are const constantly surrounded and constituted um, cons constituted um, 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 by. So I think, yeah. And I think Hartman is very much a philosopher of time. She's just not a philosopher in the sense that, you know, she has a sort of more um, a, a traditional Western philosophical system, right? Um, and she has very often herself said, that she, in a lot of ways, resists totality and totality, um, totalization, to whatever that word is. Um, you all know what I mean. Um, so that she resists that. Um, I'm not sure she always does, but I do think it's important to realize that the work that she's doing, just because it's not at the, in, in the kind of language that like a Heidegger writes in or a Derrida, et cetera, and so on, is not deeply philosophical. Right, um, and that's how I generally read, and that's how I read her um, um, work. Even you know things that are considered to be more literary or biogra autobiographical, as in um, um, "Lose Your Mother," et cetera, and, um, um, and 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 so on. And yeah, I hadn't really thought about the time bit, but yeah, I, um, what what I would say is that it's not this horizon, right? 
um, in um, 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 Hartman. It's kind of the ground, um, if you will, like the muck, the, um, the swamp um, of black life that is constituted by the lives of the dead, right? So thank you. Tim? Um, um, my, I also want to ask you but both a question, and in a way the same question, it's about n normativity or your relations to normativity. Michael, I really appreciate this kind of gesture that came out in the Q&A in particular. I don't want to pose relationlessness um, as a problem because of that being a, a profoundly or deeply conservative operation. I, 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 so I take then you to be, to be um, resisting the sort of um, late Frankfurt School um, tendencies, uh, represented by someone like uh, Raoul Yegi, in in kind of um, normativizing sort of alien, uh, non alienation. Um, anyway, I just sort of wanted to um, to sort of, uh, um, in a sense, confirm that that, that there is a kind of um, deep. Um, um, uh, um, resistance to any kind of norm normativity as a sort of principle of your project, which also leads me to want to ask you, um, Alex, about your um, project, this periodic, this alternative periodic table, and this series of terms in particular. I mean, are these series of terms, they seem to me to be in the ones that you've talked about so far, but I'm, I, again, I'm not sure, to be, in a way, sort of symptoms. I mean, each one is, a, is in, in a sense, a... a, a, a um, uh, a way of navigating uh, through a kind of t totality, a non-totalized a non totality of black life or blackness um, without um, uh, um, affirming any particular um, uh, answer. In other words, you're, you're undertaking a kind of um, deep, very large, um, almost kind of poetic, in that sense, Hartman-esque, um, 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 uh, diagnosis of um, the cert of certain structures within which um, uh, we can uh, understand and read and uh, historicize, but without necessarily um, putting forward a, a, a kind of platform of change. Um, is that what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> if you put it that way, Tim, then then yes. <laughs> Um, I definitely do not have a platform for um, for for change. Um, I think that there 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 might be moments in there where there are openings for change. That's always what I'm mu much more interested in than um, any kind of totalizing um, 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 platforms. And I I think. Um, this is something that I learned from both W.B. Du Bois and Walter Benjamin, and um, the way that I, and, um, for myself, always describe their, their work as a kind of asystematic systematicity. And I think that's kind of what I aspire to. And that's what the, um, um, the periodic table um, gives me. And I'm not really interested in you know, having the elements be in any way correlated. Um, in any way strictly echoing the um, 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 the, the um, um, elements. It's much more of a kind of, um, it's both a poetic but also a thought exercise in terms of what can be an element and what can be an element if looked at, viewed at, perceived at from the perspective of um, blackness, um, 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 black life, right? So what kind of insights do we get into um, um, something such as glitter from the perspective of black life, or you know, the rope in relationship to lynching from the perspective of black life, but also other kinds of um, um, other other kinds of um, 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 instances. And um, and blood, for instance, looks at that's one of the entries that I've already written. Um, the kind of creative use of the idea of blood by black writers such as Jackie Kay and particularly black queer writers who use it as a kind of imaginative space to reimagine what kinship relation, you know, in relation defined in that way, not in, um, 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 in other ways could be, right? So, um, so I'm not saying that it's, um, 
Yeah, there's no platform for change, but it doesn't necessarily the ex exclude the possibility for um, 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 for change. And I'm not sure diagnostic is the right term. It's more like a kind of um, deep taking stock, if that makes sense. Um, diagnostic is like a little bit too scientific for me. And I'm even though it's a, the the periodic table of elements, I'm really resisting the science aspect of it. Like you know, because I really don't want to replicate that because it's so deeply violent, which doesn't mean that I'm excluding narratives about science, about genetics, um, about blood, about all these different things that kind of fall into the purview of, um, um, of science. But I'm really trying to give sort of different perspectives on those things than science, um, um, traditional science has, um, um, has, has, has given us um, um, thus far. So thank you. That's great. I'll try to be brief. Uh <laughs> I don't think it's uh, ever honest. I mean, you could resist normativity, right? But you're not going to escape it. So it's which normativities do you engage in? Um, and what do you try to put together out of them that might allow for um, something else, right? Or some non-normative aspect um, that arises at the meeting of different normativity, et cetera, et cetera, right? But uh, I wouldn't claim to be uh, without or moving away from normativities per se. As far as Yegi and the late Frankfurt School, um, you know, it's funny because <laughs> Yegi in particular, in putting together, you know, Marx uh, and Heidegger and uh, a certain notion of analytic philosophy in a certain way, is trying to avoid the normativities that are built into some of Marx's concepts, right? <laughs> uh, and certainly it's more interesting than uh, like Ishvan Mesarov's stuff, or like, I, I, you know, um, and we could go to, actually I find Ullman more interesting if we wanted to go, but um, you know, I find some of the ways she develops Marxian concepts useful. Uh, but yes, in the end, this paper is very much so written against that, um, but using it against itself because, you know, you got to do that, right, <laughs> in this tradition. Um, so showing how even relationlessness as a quality of relations still can um, bring forth that which is imagined as relation or absent in the relation, et cetera, right? I hope that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I'm told by Adi that I really have to <laughs> stop. I had many questions <laughs> myself, but that will be during coffee break. Uh, thank you so much for this.